morning, everybody. My name is Glenn Kaler. I'm an associate scientist for integrated pest management. I work at the Diagnostic and Research Lab in Orono, University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Other members of the team are Rick Kurzbergen, who's also a Cooperative Extension, and Senator Russell Black from the legislature. Um, just introducing our report starts off with an introduction overview to Maine agriculture overall because the Natural and Working Lands Committee, at least the person I talked to on it at that time, ask for that and just to so include some basic statistics about production and areas of um, involvement. Maine agriculture is about $667 dollars million, million dollars per year in direct sales. Um, the Cooperative Extension website calls it a $1 billion industry. That $667 million does not include multipliers, that's just direct sales. It's, uh, Maine is the largest and most diverse agricultural economy in New England. Um, as I go through my talk here, just keep in mind that Maine agriculture is, is also part of a larger national and international network, so an economy. So what happens here depends a lot on what happens elsewhere. Um, so in terms of the weather variables, such as what Sean was talking about, it's the averages are important, and a longer growing season is overall a, a favorable thing because we're a little bit on the cool side for a lot of crops. Of course, we do have cool season crops like potatoes and broccoli that necessarily don't want to get warmer. Um, if you look at the national values for precipitation, Maine has a more favorable soil moisture profile going ahead than most other parts of the United States. So that's, that could be seen as another favorable. But it's not the averages that matter. That soil moisture statement is based on the yearly average soil moisture. What counts is when that rain arrives or when that precipitation arrives and how clumped is it. And one negative issue is the increased variability. And that one way that is expressed is in field work days. Now, a field work day is a day on which you can get out onto your ground to run a tractor and plant or till or whatever you need to do. And what's, what we've seen is a decline in the number of field work days. And so this slide just shows what a field work day looks like. Um, and this, the, this is Sonia Berthasol did some work on compiling the trends in field work days in Maine. And uh, the last two years in particular, Sean showed that high precip Farmers had a hard time getting out onto their fields. I saw ruts and orchards this year that places I had never seen before. Um, it was a wet spring. And this is what a field, a, a lost field work day would look like. And we photoshopped those hoop houses into this picture that that's one type of adaptation that can be done to deal with that situation. Speaking of adaptation, uh, Maine farmers have expressed needs for information and support services, um, logistical support, but also in financial capital, because most Maine farms run on a thin profit margin, and they don't have a pile of money sitting around to switch things to some new methodology. So there's a lot there. And then, of course, the regulatory environment has a lot to do with how Maine agriculture operates. Most of the um, growing season information is favorable, as I said, but it's not always favorable. And another example is low bush blueberry is currently in the optimal zone for its climate envelope for production. And the expectation is that that zone is going to move north out of the down east area. So in terms of the emissions profile, this slide says Maine is um, that livestock agriculture is 3.9 percent of the greenhouse emissions, that's a national statistic. I just learned this morning in um, the slide shown from the DEP that nationally agriculture is about 9% of U.S. emissions. Well, if we're only 2% of emissions in Maine, then I guess we would cut this number by a quarter and call it 1%. Uh, that, we need to figure that out. But methane emissions are are a factor, you need to be aware if you're reading like national reports, there's vast differences in the efficiency of methane emissions from dairy. Dairy in India produces much more 
emissions per gallon of milk than does in Maine in particular. There are ways of dealing with this, uh, feed rations, um, anaerobic digesters are a way to handle manure and you actually take that liability and turn it into a new product of you can make your own fuel. So agriculture is a source of emissions that also can be part of the uh, solutions and these are just some ways of managing croplands croplands that are tilled, which adds up to about 123,000 acres across the state. That's, that's, that's a, may sound like a big number, but compared to forestry, it's, it's very small. So, and if this scenario here is, if, if we increase the organic matter in those tilled soils by a half percent, um, and these are some of the methods that can be used to do that, and this work has been demonstrated, you can do it. In fact, the 10-year Maine Potato Systems trial, they increased organic matter by 2%. But that was kind of an un unrealistic situation. They were really intensively managed. So this is a little more realistic scenario. Um, you could bury about a million tons of carbon. Now you turn that into carbon dioxide equivalent, that's about 3.7 million tons. And that is represents about 20% of one year annual emissions. A, a, a more accurate way to look at it is it would take 10 years at least to do this process. That process would represent about 2% of Maine's emissions per year over that 10 years. Another source of agricultural emissions are from nitrogen and fertilizers. They have different ways of just their very Manufacture, though I guess the way DEP counts things, you wouldn't count that as a main contribution because they're not manufactured here. But in the global sense, of course, they had to be made somewhere. Um, they, microbial conversion does turn some of that nitrogen and fertilizer into nitrous oxide. Um, you also have you know, runoff issues, um, groundwater issues. But the, and there are good agricultural practices such as I just showed on the previous slide that deal with this. Um, the good news about climate change adaptation for Maine agriculture is it really doesn't involve new and exotic methods or infrastructure, it's just good farming. If you look at how we could deal with it, it's good farming practices that we already know about and we already have incentives to do, such as increasing organic matter in soils. That has many benefits. It makes the soil not only whole water better, it also makes the soil drain better, which I find quite fascinating that it does both ends of that equation. So the report, the agriculture report is not just agriculture, it's also food systems. Um, I chose to define that and focus in on food insecurity. Um, a couple statistics are on the slide there. The two that jump out at me are that 14% of Maine households are food insecure. In other words, they're not necessarily sure where their future meals are coming from. And the one I find most unacceptable is 20% of Maine children. Now, how many of the people in this room really have any doubts about whether they're, where they're gonna eat next week? That, I don't get onto a social soapbox, but that's something we need to change. There's enough food in Maine to not have that happen. It's not a food supply issue. You already know this. It's a distribution issue, socioeconomic issues. Um, looking at the food system uh, at a slightly different angle, 90% um, of Maine's food is brought in from out of state. So we have a vibrant agriculture, and yet 90% of our food comes in from elsewhere. I think a lot of that comes up I-95 across that Piscataqua River Bridge. I wonder about that. Is that, a, is that a vulnerability point? I'm talking to some people about that. Um, and another issue about emissions reduction is reducing food waste. That alone is a huge source of emissions. If, if you don't waste the food, you know, you, that's an emissions profile there. And in that November 1 storm that Sean showed pictures of, my local IGA, I came in on the next day because they had shut down. They had, their shelves, their freezer shelves were empty, and I said, wow, you know, that's serious. How much you throw out? $30,000 of food went away. And I said, that's a shame. Um, you know, it's too bad we couldn't give that to food cupboards. And he said, no, we can't do it because of liability. Well, it turns out there was some film shown at the university last year that that's actually a myth. 
that there's a law that says you can't be sued in that situation. However, the grocery store manager told me, yeah, well, that doesn't matter because my insurance company requires that. It's not what the law says. And then I, I keep trying here, right? And I said, well, how about feeding, giving that to hog farmers? The pigs aren't going to sue you. Well, even that's not simple because apparently I was told that would have to be pasteurized before you gave it to the pigs. So I think we could do better on that angle too, and I'll conclude with that.